uh, new to Mount Hope Church, uh, Pastor Dave Williams was a uh, pastor here for over 30 years. And uh, he was an awesome man. During his leadership, this church exploded, went over from uh, 200 people to over 2,000 people, planted churches all over the world. We've seen dramatic, dramatic breakthrough under his teachings. And much of the success that we enjoy today is because of the foundation of prayer that he laid, the principles that he put in place that we still utilize till this day. Would you please join me in honoring and welcoming Pastor Dave Williams. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, Joe. God bless you. Well, thanks. You're way too good to me, my grandchildren. <laughs> Please be seated. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Joe. Isn't Pastor Joe awesome? I mean, he has got the most beautiful family. And I'll tell you, my mom, is she back there? Um, yeah, she's waving at me back there. She's my discerno meter. She tells me who's good and who's not. And she says, you know, I like that Joe. And she says, I like that Peter Reeves, too. That Peter Reeves, too. Because you know? whenever she meets somebody new, Jeff, has she met you yet? I'd like you to pass through her uh, discerno. <laughs> I'll tell you, Jeff and Andrea Bassett, we've known for years, Jeff, attended, I think it was our church planner school down in Florida, and he is just a wonderful guy. He didn't want anybody to know he was religious, so he stabbed him, and no, that was a joke, you know, that, that, but uh, it was, it, it, you know, two of the most honorable people, George and Andrea, you're going to love them when you meet them. They'll be taking um, Scott and Ruth's place. Scott and Ruth Thompson are heading for Indonesia as missionaries. <laughs> Mary Jo and I have scattled to, we've already made our arrangements to help support them, and, and um, I, hope, I hope you will too. I know that Mount Hope Church will. I mean, Scott's been with us for 100 years or more. <laughs> now Indonesia will get him for another 100 years unless Jesus comes. Wouldn't that be funny if, if just when he lands in Indonesia, Jesus comes and... Uh, it, 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 but he saw your heart, Scott. He knew you wanted to reach those Indonesian people. Well, I'm really thrilled that Pastor Kev invited me to be here for a couple of weeks with you because I get to missing you sometimes. I'm all over the, I really, uh, many states, I won't say all over the country, but from east to Midwest to south and ministering in churches all over, but there's no place like Mount Hope Church. And there's no pastor like Pastor Kevin Berry. He is the best. He'll be back next week, I'm sure. And if uh, you're watching this by live stream and you're not in church, you'll have time to get here and make the altar call. <laughs> Just a couple of announcements. Club 52, the full-blown Club 52, is returning in October October to January 19th with the holidays off on Saturdays from 9 o'clock to 1230. Uh, it, Club 52 is what we call Millionaires with a Mission. If you would like somebody to come up and give you $10,000, wouldn't you rather be the person that could walk up and give the $10,000? Then we could help people like Steve and Natalie and their family that are in places that are lights for Jesus. They're being lights for Jesus Christ and, as you heard, bringing people to Jesus. You know, 12 might not be big, but that's what Jesus started with. And we're bringing in spirit-filled millionaires that are connected to the Great Commission, Church Charity Missions. And we're bringing them in because they think differently. They think differently than other people. I'm bringing in a man whose uh, income is over a million dollars a year. I'm bringing in many of uh, our local spirit-filled millionaires to present at Club 52. It's 
an intensive time because I believe God wants you to be one of them. If you think it's God's will for all the sinners to be the millionaires, you have never read the Bible. And it's time that we get our theology of wealth correct, our attitude of wealth correct, and then the practical actions for wealth correct. I've even got Chris Rayner coming in from Nevada to present. He's a multi-million dollar real estate developer and all. And for those of you that are interested in, I've got people that will be training in real estate, people training in investments, and then we're going to talk about the attitudinal and the theological aspects of wealth. And sometimes opportunities like this only come once in a lifetime. You sit there and you say, well, I can't afford it. Well, you, you probably don't need to be there then because you'll probably never be able to afford anything. When a missionary comes and we receive an offering for a missionary, you won't be able to afford it. Well, I gave you last week a couple stories of people that couldn't afford it but did it. And we've got testimonies. You're going to hear testimonies of people that sopped up nearly $500,000 in debt, personal debt, how they sopped it up and became spirit-filled millionaires in just six to nine years, 14 couples. And it's always better if a husband and wife can take it together because there, divorces in America have their roots, 90%, in money differences, different philosophy of money. The philosophy is, you earn it, I spend it. <laughs> and when a husband and wife can work together on family wealth and stay connected to the Great Commission, they're going to find unusual financial miracles. It's not a, God's not against wealth. He's against covetousness and greed. But he's not against wealth. Well, what about that scripture that says it's harder for somebody to get into the kingdom that's rich than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. My brother, my sister, we're already in the kingdom. We don't have to worry about that eye of the needle, do we? And so what I'm telling you is it, it is a time and it's not for everybody. A lady walked up to me and says, how can you teach this when Jesus said one day at a time? I said, What? Well, you know what it says in the Bible, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. <laughs> I said, well, you know, you, I guess you can believe that if you want to. Okay, now the other thing that I, that I need to tell you is if you want to understand Bible prophecy, this is the only book. I, I, this is my newest book. Charisma House Frontline published it. It's available everywhere, but we've got a few copies here. We have sold out again. They keep selling out. Even Mike Persons back there, you almost sold out at Barnes & Noble the first day this was released. We, I think he had 200 copies and almost all of them sold. And um, hope in the last days, be prepared for the biblical prophecies coming to pass. If you want to understand Bible prophecy, this is the only book I know that takes the prophecies and develops an approximate timeline when these prophecies will be fulfill, fulfilled and potential scenarios. This book has the gospel. It tells you how I met Jesus Christ in Daniel chapter 2. This book is a soul winning book. People all over the country tell me, send me little notes and say it's the best book on prophecy I've ever read. Even Rabbi Eric Walker said that it's the only book you need on prophecy right along with your Bible. So if you just don't get it, I don't get it. I don't get that. Understand. I don't understand Bible prophecy. This is the book for you. People tell me they can't put it down once they start it. And I promise it's going to be good. But if you buy it today, you can get it at Barnes & Noble, Walmart.com, Christian Book Distributors, uh, Amazon, any place you can get it. And probably for about $14. Christian book distributors just had a sale. It was $11, but now that, that sale only went, oh, it goes till tomorrow. 
But we've got some copies out there, and we're selling them for $15. It's a $15.99 book, so you get 99 cents off. But if you buy it today at the entrances or the exits, and also people out there to answer your questions about Club 52 coming, don't wait. Once we have 300 registrations, and we will, it's over. You're cut out then if, if you sit and wait. There are payment plans available and all. But if you buy the Hope in the Last Days book today, we're going to give you a free copy of Angels. They are watching you. And you need to know that because there are many false ideas about angels today. Not only that, we're going to give you $50 worth of bonus downloads. In other words, digitally, we're going to email you. Somebody out there needs you, the book, World Beyond, the book about heaven, we're going to send you America's Role in Bible Prophecy. That's an audio. And we're also going to send you End Time Events. That's an audio uh, presentation. In fact, that's the one that Charisma heard when they asked me to write the book on Hope in the Last Days. And you can get that at, I think, just, I think it's at every exit, but I'm not sure. There, my advertisements are done. Are you ready to stand and make our declaration together? Say it with me. I believe, the Bible. I believe the Bible. It is God's Word, is God's inspired, word. By inspired by the Holy Spirit. I believe that book. Believe that book. It shows me the way to heaven, me the way to heaven. through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Christ the, book alone. the book is filled with treasures, promises and assets, promises and assets. that belong to, me by faith. belong to me by faith. Today faith will come. Today, faith will come. My faith will grow. And I will release my faith for miracles in my life. I declare the devil bound, unable to pluck up the seed that's planted in my heart this day. God, open the eyes of my understanding. Give me ears to hear what your spirit is saying. Give me a heart to obey. And help Pastor Dave preach real simple. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Pastor Kev really thinks I'm a miracle worker because he wants me to do the entire chapter of Mark 13 in 30 minutes. As we sit here today, a massive convergence of very specific signs has emerged for the first time in any generation. Very specific signs, precise markers, and categorical conditions that the prophets told us would be on the earth just before an impending inevitable event. There is an unavoidable, imminent event just on the horizon. Jesus said, I will come again. And in Mark 13, which is the Reader's Digest version, because Mark is fast moving, if you have a pencil, write this down. You read Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2, and Revelation 6 through 19. Then you'll get the whole picture. But in Mark 13, it's like going to a movie and seeing previews of coming attractions. Jesus begins to give previews of some of the coming attractions in the final hours. Now there's something we have to understand. So listen very carefully. Right now we are living in a parenthetical age. All prophecy has to do with Israel and the Hebrew people, the Jewish people. But God chose to stop the clock prophetically as it relates to Israel when Jesus died on the cross. 
and we went into a parenthetical age we call the church age or the age of grace or the time of the Gentiles because the door of salvation opened to Gentiles because the Jewish people originally rejected their Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God incarnate. And they had him crucified. And Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 11. He said, some of the people, verse 25, some of the people of Israel have hard hearts. But this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes in. When the full number of Gentiles comes in, the parentheses of this age of grace goes closed. And then everything reverts to something like the Old Testament as we go into or as the world goes into what I call the final Shabuah or the final seven. The final seven years. That's all that's missing in the Jewish prophetic calendar. But something has to trigger the restarting of that prophetic calendar and it's when the parentheses, the age of grace, goes closed. The church age is over. The last Gentile has come to Christ and God knows who it is. It may be somebody in this room today. It may be somebody watching on live stream. God knows when the final Gentile comes to Christ, the church age is over. And then the Jewish people will begin to have a true spiritual revival. But I want you to remember something as we study this. Discernment is our lifeline in these last days. Now, Mark 1, Mark 13, verse 1, is Jesus, and, and by the way, I'm reading from the new translation, the Passion Translation. I just got one from Mary Jo, and I thought I'd try it out. As Jesus was leaving the temple courts, one of his disciples came to him and said, Teacher, look at these magnificent buildings and what tremendous stones were used to build all this. Jesus turned to them and said, Take a good look at all these enormous buildings, for I'm telling you, there will not be one stone left upon another. It will be all leveled. Later, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, overlooking the temple, his disciples, Peter, Jacob, and John. Doesn't that sound weird? Doesn't it sound like it should be Peter, James, and John? Apparently, James was Jacob. Peter, Jacob, and John and Andrew came to him privately where he was sitting and said, tell us when will these things happen? And what supernatural signs should we expect to signal your coming in the completion of this age? He was talking about completing that particular age just before the age of grace. But he's also talking about the end of this age because this in prophetic Writing is known as prophecy with a double reference. Jesus is not only talking about the end times at the end of the age of grace, he's talking about something that's going to happen in Jerusalem in the near future. And one translation said, pay close attention. I'm not just talking to a future generation, but I'm also talking to you. That meant it's the law of the double reference. Now, Jesus answered, and he starts giving them the conditions. He said, at that time, deception will run rampant. So beware that you're not fooled. For many will appear on the scene claiming my authority, saying about themselves, I am God's anointed, and they will lead many astray. Now, we know that there are two kingdoms operating in this world. There's the invisible kingdom called God's kingdom. Angels. Authority of God. But there's another dark kingdom of this world that the Bible says Satan is the god of this dark world system. And imposters will come 
using the authority of Jesus in order to do what? Deceive people. They employ the name of Jesus. I sat with Mark Buntain, the iconic missionary to India, in 1988, just before he went to heaven the next year. I still remember it like it was yesterday. Mary Jo and I were there. Mark was there. And all of a sudden, Mark got a concerned look on his face. And he looked at me and he said, Pastor Dave, he said, if I only had one message that I could ring out across this nation, it would be about the inroads of the New Age movement. Now, the New Age movement is really just Eastern philosophy and religion mixed with occultism. So when people are New Agers, you know, they kind of accept a little bit of spiritism. They'll accept a little bit of Hinduism. They accept a little bit of Buddhism. It, it doesn't matter. Whatever works for them. And I thought that was strange. He'd warn America about the New Age movement because he had been in India long enough to see some things. And he saw some of the Indian, Hinduistic, Eastern thought that was penetrating into America and even some of our American churches. It all started really back in the 1940s became bigger in 1950s when this guy named Paramahansa Yogananda came to America and started the Divine uh, Self-Realization Fellowship. And he started writing books about Jesus. He wrote a book called The Second Coming of Jesus. And he wrote a book called The Yoga of Jesus. And in it, he interpreted New Testament scriptures and said that many Christians have it wrong. And he was employing the name of Jesus. And he said that he got his revelation from the Christ consciousness. Now, whenever you hear Christ consciousness, Christ alignment, Christ pattern, you're dealing with with an Eastern philosophy or religion. And Mark saw it as coming into the United States back in 1988. One promoter of Eastern thought wrote, we must know Jesus as an Oriental Christ, a supreme yogi who manifested full mastery of the universal science of God union and thus could speak and act as a savior. The only way Jesus could act as a savior is if he reached universal Christ consciousness. Do you mind if I tell you who the real Jesus is? Jesus Christ is the creator. He always was. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they were there on creation. They all had their particular role to play on creation. There was no hope for man. Man was hopelessly lost, had no Savior. But in the plans of heaven, from the foundations of the world, the Son of God volunteered to become one of us, to take the rap for us. So he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life, did miracles. He did good everywhere he went. He held scorn for religious leaders. He died on a cross. That was not fun for him. People say, well, I don't have time for church. What if Jesus didn't have time to die for you? He died on a cross. He rose from the dead. He ascended back to heaven, but before he left, he said, I will come again to judge the living and the dead. The problem is people think judgment day is going to be one day. No, it's going to be seven years. 
the final Shabuah, that final missing seven years in the prophetic puzzle. Jesus called it the greatest time of anguish ever on the earth. The great, the time of tribulation and great tribulation. Deception is dulling people's hearts to the truth of what is coming to this earth. We have political deception, religious deception, social deception, racial deception, financial deception, and we're witnessing right now as we sit here today a huge escalation in deceptions that will lead people to that strong delusion spoken of in 2 Thessalonians where they'll have no hope of being saved. The delusion will be so deep. And I put it this way. The small deceptions that we allow into our lives and our practices today will become the strong delusion of tomorrow. And so Jesus said the number one sign is going to be deception. Satan's goal is to anesthetize the masses, making them oblivious to what lies just ahead. Then he continues. You'll hear of rumors of wars nearby with more rumors of wars to come. Now he's speaking in Jerusalem. He's saying you'll hear of wars and how many have heard of any wars and rumors of wars coming out of the Middle East? And what is it all over? Jerusalem. In fact, Armageddon is going to be about dividing the land. Joel chapter 2 tells us that about the dividing of Israel. And how many presidents have tried to divide Israel? Well, if you, if you give up this land for peace, every time they gave up land for peace, there was no peace. And the final end of time, Armageddon will be fought. It's going to be over Israel. It's not going to be, well, we're going to just kill one another. That'll ultimately, that's ultimately happening in the world at that time. But it's all about ownership of Israel. And he said, when these conditions are prevalent, you know the time is short. But he said, don't be thrown into a panic or give in to your fears for these things are destined to happen. Prepare for it, but the end is still not. Now listen to this. For nations will go to war against each other and kingdom against kingdom. Now the word nations there is ethnos, which means ethnic groups will be at each other's throats. And he said seismic events, earthquakes, and seismic events of epic proportion, famines and riots, this is how the first contractions and birth pains of the new age will begin, not new age new age, but the, the new age after the age of grace. Or, if he was speaking specifically of Jerusalem, the new age after the Holy Spirit would come, which would be this new age of grace, the church age. Now, ethnic disturbances, have you ever heard the term ethnic cleansing? Do you know what year that came into wide usage? It was it was in the 1990s. There was no such term before the 1990s. And yet we've seen just in the last century more ethnic groups against ethnic groups than ever. The Hooties against the Tooties. In Rwanda, look at the people that were killed. Bodies floating up in Lake uh, Victoria in Tanzania coming from Rwanda polluting the water some people look at Hitler you know and the Nazis six million Jews men women boys and girls families ripped apart burned in the ovens uh, killed medical experiments that would blow your mind performed on these people. The suffering 
is like no other suffering. People say, well, Hitler's dead, but the demon that possessed him is still alive. And the demon that possessed Hitler probably possessed Paul Pot in Cambodia when he started ethnic cleansing, two million of the Cambodian citizens that might have had a little Thai or Chinese in them. And have you heard Serbia, Kosovo, Croatia? Have you heard about that? Have you heard about the ethnic cleansing that is now going on in South Africa where they're killing the white farmers? But they've got to be careful because that's what China did in the revolution. They killed the farmers and the people that were left didn't know how to farm and 60 million people died starved to death we're seeing history repeat itself why because demons don't die they just go to another place so we're seeing ethnic disturbances and there are those even in America that are stirring up ethnic disturbances but I want to tell you the church of Jesus Christ better have never have any of that I'll tell you, you know what makes a church I say man we need all kinds, all nationalities. We had an African-American lady that didn't want to come to our church because she thought we were just a white suburban church. I said, I want to tell you, the African-American people have added soul to us. <laughs> Listen to them sing. And I want to tell you something else. Learning other cultures. We've got people from other nations, and learning these other cultures is a beautiful thing when we're part of the same body. I had a, a black pastor friend that preached a message one time called, we bad, that's right, we bad. And, and back then that was the slang meaning we're really good. You see, you gotta keep up with what it means. And, and, I got up and preached that day and I said, I want to tell you something, we bad. I said, that's right, we bad. And people are looking at me like, what's he talking about, we bad. And I, and, and I explained to them, I didn't know that Wayne Benson, the pastor of the largest church in Michigan at that time, was in the congregation that day. He sent me a note. Dear Pastor David Williams, you bad. <laughs> But Jesus said not only will deception be running rampant and ethnic problems disturbing the nations of the world, he said there would be increased seismic activity. Costa Rica just had an earthquake. Alaska, we've got friends in Alaska that said they could feel the tremors, had over 200 earthquakes. The last one was 6.6 .6 on the Richter scale just Saturday, yesterday. August 16th, 240 cubic miles of magma, molten rock, glass, gases, was just discovered beneath California's Long Valley supervolcano. Friday, Japan had another huge earthquake. They're still assessing the damage in Hawaii. In Guatemala, just in June this year, a whole village, along with its people, was buried in lava that surged down the side of a mountain of a volcano. Friday, Peru, a volcano erupted. In fact, scientists are telling us that this looks like it's going to be the worst year for seismic activity throughout the entire Earth. But he said there'd be famines. We, we've always heard of famines, and we've seen the little children in Ethiopia. But what about right here in America? There was a CBS News report August 15th, just a few days ago. Weed-killing chemicals linked to cancer found in some children's breakfast foods. And then the Business Insider had an article August 13th that the pharmaceutical giant Bayer plunges 11% after landmark $289 million weed killer cancer ruling. 
that bare bought Monsanto and people that use Roundup and some of that has gly glycosophate, some, some name like that in it, they found that it was cancer causing and apparently, I don't know if the company knew it or not, I know they lost the lawsuit. Could it be that our ground has become so polluted with cancer causing carcinogenic pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, all these sides we've put on our supply, and they've, they've even got the kind that goes into the seed and actually becomes a part of the plant so that the plant is bug resistant, and then you're eating it. Could it be that we find out more about this and the United States goes into a food shortage and then there really be, will be those food wars? Riots. Then he goes to verse 9. Be on your guard, for they will repeatedly hand you over. And now, now this actually happened. If you read the book of Acts, this happened to the early Jewish Christians. You will be beaten in public gatherings. Happened to Paul. Happened to Peter. And you will stand trial before kings and high-ranking government officials, government leaders, as an opportunity to testify to them on my behalf. But prior to the end of the age, the hope of the gospel must first be preached to all nations. So when they put you under arrest and hand you over for trial, don't even give a thought about what you'll say. Simply speak what the Holy Spirit gives you at that moment and realize that it won't be you speaking, but the Holy Spirit repeatedly speaking through you. And then he says, family disturbances, brothers will betray each other unto death. Even a father, his child, children will rise up and take a stand against their parents and have them put to death. Now during that time of the final Shabua, that final seven years, that tribulation period, which the final 42 months is known as the Great Tribulation, when the world leader will have secured global um, allegiance. During that time, we find something very interesting. In Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we find the church in heaven. In Revelation 6, we find the first part of the tribulation beginning in Revelation, all the way through Revelation 19, with Revelation 13 being the midpoint in that seven years. We find something else very interesting. We find that chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 of Revelation are written in grace language. They're, they're written using grace terminologies as if it was written for the age of grace. You get to chapter 6, all of a sudden, it's written in Hebrew terminology, telling me that final seven years is all about the nation Israel. It doesn't mean it won't be global, this tribulation, but it's, about, it's God's dealing with his chosen people, and don't you ever go against Israel or the Jewish people, ever. The reason for that is you'll end up like Haman, His family warned him, oh, if Mordecai's a Jew, it's hopeless. You can't go against him. You can't win. Everybody that's ever come against the Jewish people, and I know there's replacement. It's another deception in the church, replacement theology. The church is the new Israel. You know the Greek word for that. It starts with bull. And he says in verse 13, expect to be hated by all because of your allegiance to the cause that bears my name, but determined to be faithful to the end, and you will be saved. Now that word saved there means rescued. God says, if you're faithful to me, no matter what the conditions are on the exterior, if you're faithful to me, I'm going to be faithful to rescue you every time. Save means rescued because nobody's ever saved by, uh, saved spiritually at least by enduring anything. It refers to physical protection. 
and preservation of those during the greatest time of anguish on this earth, the tribulation period. And, and by the way, in Virginia, a pastor is facing eviction for holding a Bible study in his apartment. The apartment owners said if he wishes to stay, he must never pray or discuss the Bible with anyone in that apartment complex. We've got a transgender running for a governor of our state, not our state, but a governor of the state here, who says that the greatest threat in America are radicalized Christians. Well, I want to tell you, I'm a radicalized Christian. I'm bad. That's right, we bad. I would rather be a radicalized Christian than a deceived, lukewarm nincompoop. <laughs> then he talks about the image of the beast, which is very interesting. He said in verse 14, when you witness what Daniel prophesied, the disgusting destroyer, standing where it must not be, let the reader learn what it means, then those in the land of Judah must escape to higher ground. On that day, if you happen to be outside, don't go back inside to gather your belongings. If you're working out in the field, don't run back home to get a coat. Just go. Now, he said that when the Jewish believers, the Jewish Christian believers saw Titus coming into Jerusalem, they obeyed Jesus. They didn't get a coat. They didn't run back home. They went to the hills, just like Jesus said, and went to Petra. And did you know, not even though thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Jews were slaughtered, Jerusalem was totally destroyed, almost totally destroyed. And then Titus put a symbol of an eagle, which was the symbol of the Roman Empire at that time, on the temple. And they believed that was a desecration, and they headed for the hills. Not one Christian died during that invasion of Jerusalem. You see, when you're faithful to God, he's going to be faithful to you to protect you. And so... We find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and 3, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, that the Antichrist will set his image, image up in the third temple that will be built perhaps very soon. It will be especially hard for pregnant women for nursing their babies in those days, so pray that your escape will be not during winter months. Other gospels add the Sabbath. Pray that it's not the Sabbath. Well, that would only pertain to... Um, the, the early Jewish believers on that one. But now he tells us, and this is the law of the double reference, he says it's going to be very hard in Jerusalem in a few years, but he says I'm also talking to a future generation. He was talking to you and me. And he said there will come a time of great misery beyond the magnitude of anything the world has ever seen from the beginning of time or ever will see. Unless God limits those days, no one would escape. But because of his love for those chosen to be his, he will shorten the time of trouble. The final 42 months before Christ returns with his saints and the church will be the worst on earth ever. The first 42 months of that seven years is not going to be good, but the second 42 months of that seven years will be the worst in all of history. There will be no precedent for it. 21 rapid-fire judgments will be falling on the earth from which there is no escape. Now, Jesus said there are some that will not escape this. He said when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. In that whole chapter of 1 Thessalonians 5, he shows the difference between we and they us and them. All these great promises for us, all these bad promises for them. Who are them? Those who have refused the love of the truth and had pleasure in unrighteousness. 
And then Luke 21, 36 talks about some who will escape. He said, watch ye there. This is the same subject in Luke 21 as it is Mark 13. He said, watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. In other words, Jesus knows there can be an escape from all these things that are coming. If we watch and pray that we escape and stand before the Son of Man. So there's two classes of people, those who will escape and those who won't. And if you hear reports, look, the Messiah is over here, the Messiah is over there, don't believe it. For there will be imposters falsely claiming to be God's anointed one, a false prophet. False prophets will arise to perform miracle signs if it were possible they would cause God's chosen ones to wander off the right track. Put your hand on your heart and say, discernment is my lifeline. Now Jesus said, be alert, for I prophesy all this will happen. If Jesus prophesied it, it's going to happen. He said, this is what will take place after that suffering or after the tribulation or the final Shabua. The stars will be falling from the sky and all the cosmic powers will be shaken. This is not a metaphor. This is actually going to happen. And he says, all the cosmic powers will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man appearing in the midst of clouds. Now, you've heard of the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews? There's going to be a lot of people dressed in white that will be coming back with Jesus on white horses that's going to look like a big cloud in the sky at first. And at that time, he will send his messengers or angels who will gather together his beloved chosen ones from every direction, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Those that choose Jesus Christ during that most terrible time on earth are faithful to him, and they make it through that seven years. He's going to send angels now. People say, well, right there is the rapture. The rapture is taught, the rapture, the catching away of the church is taught in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you don't believe in the rapture, you're probably not a Christian because you don't believe in the Bible. The problem Christians, every Christian believes in the rapture. They just have different ideas when it'll happen. But if you notice this event where angels go out and gather up people, it's totally different than when Jesus is talking about the church being caught up. At the church, there's only one angel. At the, at the church going home, there's only one angel. The archangel. Jesus is not coming back to earth. He's only coming in the air. Here he's coming back to earth. He's coming back to earth with all of his saints. And those who came to Christ that missed the catching away of the church, which closes the age of grace or closes the church age, the last Gentile comes to Christ, it goes closed, boom. Now the earth is free to enter into that seven years of human government that will be under the direct dictatorship of Satan. And he's preparing people's minds right now. There are billionaires that are Luciferian because they believe that Lucifer is the God of this world. They believe the Bible when Lucifer said, I'll give to Jesus all the kingdoms if you bow and worship me. And they actually believe and teach that, that Lucifer got a bad rap from God because God got jealous of him. And they believe the way to control cities and nations is to be a Luciferian because Lucifer controls these, they believe. So, we're seeing the setup right now. The convergence is the number one sign. The convergence of all the signs is the number one sign that this is, this is likely the generation Jesus will come back. And he talks about in verses 28 to 30, 
you learn a lesson from a fig tree. When spring arrives, it sends out its tender branches and sprouts and leaves. You know that summer is soon to appear. In other words, when you see leaves and blossoms, you know pretty soon fruit's going to come out. He said, when you see these signs, these markers, these conditions, you know that it's getting very, very near. Nobody is going to be able to stop Israel. Nobody's going to be able to stop the church. He said this, I assure you, or in verse 29, when you observe all these things progressively taking place, you know that he is coming near, even at the door. I assure you this family or this generation will not pass away until all these things I have spoken. The earth and the sky will all wear out and fade away before one word I speak loses its power or fails to accomplish its purpose. Concerning that day and exact hour, no one knows when it will arrive, nor the angels of heaven, not even the Son, only the Father knows. This is why you must be waiting, watching, and praying, because no one knows when that season of time will come. Nobody knows when the last Gentile is going to come to Christ. And then Jesus, true to form, gives a story. And he says like this, the days can be compared to a man who was about to leave on a journey. But before leaving, he placed his servants in charge and gave each one work to do while he was away. Jesus has given each one of us a job to do while he's away. Then he commanded the watchman to be on guard at all times. There are two major prophecy teachers in America that have said, Dave Williams, you're a watchman. You're a discerner of the times. I want every one of us to be discerners of the times and to be watchmen so we're watching over our families, watching over our loved ones. So I say keep awake and alert for you have no idea when the master of the house will return in the evening at midnight, four o'clock in the morning or at dawn. Be alert for he's coming suddenly and may find you sleeping. And I say to the four of you, what I say to the four of you, I say to everyone, everyone here at Mount Hope Church today and everyone that's watching on the live stream or replay, be awake at all times. Now he gave, I'm just going to be less than a minute. Here's what he told us to do in chapter 13. Be aware of deceptions. Weigh everything by God's word. Be in faith, true faith. Be on guard against practices or doctrines that are contrary to scripture. Be in tune with the Holy Spirit so you know how to answer people when they're grilling you. Be faithful, be alert. Don't give in to what we call rapture fatigue. You know, there were so many people predicting 1980. Uh, 1989 and then came the Harold camping and then came at 1988 uh, why, yeah wise now and then camping two times predicted dates that that were wrong and then you had that Korean cult that pick, picked a date uh, no we don't know the day we don't know the hour and it's good because parents if you go away and you tell your kids we'll be back but you don't know when they're probably not going to be partying. <laughs> so he said, be awake, don't be anesthetized. And finally he says, be ready, because once it strikes, there's no turning back. It'll occur suddenly, in an instant, with no more chance to prepare, and then it's over. If you miss the sound of the trumpet, you've missed the only escape God gave you from that coming time of trouble. And I don't know how people can mix up the second coming of Christ with the catching away of the church because the events, all the events around the events are different. When he comes for the church, business as usual. When he comes back the second time, he's coming with his church. And it's not going to be business as usual. He's coming back at Armageddon. And the question is, Today you fall into one of two categories. 
You're ready and you'll escape. Or you're not ready and you won't. You're either doing the will of God today. It's not whoso talketh about the will of God, but whoso doeth the will of God. You're either doing the will of God or you're not doing the will of God. You're either coming closer to Jesus or you're growing farther from Jesus. You're either in the light or you're in deception or some degree of deception that will lead to delusion. All of us are in those one of those categories today. So how do you get ready? Well, I can just tell you the start is you've got to admit that you've sinned. If you're away from God today, my heart cries out for you because my heart so cares about the people of this world because Jesus lives in me and he so loved the world that he was willing to give his life on that cross and shed his blood so that you and I could have a new nature put in us. That we could be like Steve and Natalie and their family would be willing to go to people that are culturally different and tell them about the love of God fearlessly. So number one, we admit that we've sinned. That's all God asks. Admit that you've sinned. Confess Jesus with your mouth. Believe that Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead. A, B, C. Admit, B, believe, C, confess with your mouth that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead and that he is your Lord. And receive him. To as many as received him, gave he them power to become sons of God. And you know, if Jesus has preeminence in your life, you are not going to swallow these tens of thousands of little deceptions that are going into the grand delusion. Amen. <laughs> Father, in these closing minutes, I ask you to do what only you can do. I've done what you've asked me to do and what Pastor Kev has asked me to do. Now I ask you to do what only you can do in our hearts, our lives, our families. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, first of all, how many of you know beyond a question, if your heart were to quit beating or Jesus were to come, you know you're ready to meet him? You remember that time in your life when you turned from your selfishness and sinful ways and you turned to God's son, Jesus, and you were born again. You remember that day? At the count of three, you slip your hand up. One, two, three. Let's slip your hand up. Thank you. Hands are going up all over. But some of you did not raise your hands. You can put them down now. You don't know for sure if your heart were to quit. Listen, you might be the key person in your family. Maybe you knew Christ at one time, but you've gotten away. You've slipped into a deception. And today's your day to come back. It's no accident that you're here. You're here today, maybe you were baptized as a baby and somehow you have lost your faith that your parents had when they baptized you. Maybe it's time to get that faith back. Because Jesus said, when I come, will I find faith on the earth? He's looking for your faith today. And I want to tell you, no demon can stop you now. Every demon is bound in this place. There are angels all around. And you have a free will. I'm going to give you an opportunity because I know how to pray a miracle prayer with you that will give you the assurance that your sins are forgiven and you'll have a home in heaven and God will give you a new nature right now. You see, you got to have that new nature because when he comes for his church, only those with the new nature are going up. Those that are just religious stay behind. I want you to be a part of what the Bible calls the first resurrection. You're here today and you'd say, Dave, pray for me. I haven't been where I should be with God or 
I want to be sure that everything is okay between God and I. At the count of three, I'm going to ask you to slip your hands up, and I'm going to pray this prayer with you. Are you ready? If you say, Dave Williams, I want to be sure that I'm going to heaven. I want to be sure that everything is okay between God and me. Would you pray that miracle prayer with me? Count of three. One, two, three. Right now, hands go up. Thank you. How many others? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, hands are going up all over. Christians, you are praying at this time. Now listen, did you really mean business with God? God is coming, Jesus is coming for those who've received him and those who are presently doing his will. If you raised your hand and you want, to, want me to pray that prayer for you, if you're willing to do this, then I know you're going to have eternal life. Are you willing? Jesus died publicly on that cross. And the Bible says, if you'll confess him before men, I'll confess you before the Father. In other words, your name is about to ring out through the loudspeakers of heaven, declaring, build another mansion. Build another mansion. We got another one. And who knows, you may be the last Gentile before that parentheses goes closed. How many again would like to pray that prayer with Pastor Dave? Slip your hand way up high. Way up high. If you raised your hand, stand to your feet right now, as fast as your legs will take you. No messing around. Now, I want you to just... Be... Would you do me a favor? And if you're standing, if you really mean business with God, come down here so I can pray that prayer with you. And everybody, ask the person on your left and the person on your right if they want to pray that prayer. Bring them down because this is their Miracle Sunday. This is what many people have been praying about. This is your miracle day. I am proud of you. I know it took a lot of courage to get out of your seat and come down here, but I'm really proud of you, man. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, man. God bless you. Come on. If somebody doesn't want to come alone, you bring them on down. This is it. This is your miracle moment. The angels in heaven are rejoicing. Some of you are having hot flashes. And listen, I had a word from the Lord as I was praying this morning. A lady, um, I prayed this at the 830 service, but I believe there's... I believe a lady here, you have been not so much physically abused as you've been emotionally abused by the words of somebody. And I want you to know that those words are all lies. God has a different word for you. God has made you a beautiful princess. You're the apple of his eye. He loves you, and he seated you with him in heavenly places. Quit believing the lies. You are a treasure, not a piece of trash. All right, how many others want to get in? I've got 10 seconds. This altar closes. If you want in on this prayer and you're having a hot flash, thinking, oh, I don't want to go up there in front of them. Listen, this is it. The anointing will be over after this. And if you come up, thank you. All right. You don't have to understand everything, but you got to believe it because Jesus said it. He said, as, as many as received him, gave he them the power to become sons and daughters of God. You know what's going to happen in the next 30 seconds? Every sin you ever committed that's on that calculator in heaven, Jesus is going to walk over and hit the clear button so there's a big zero there. Every sin you ever committed is going back to Jesus when he died on the cross, and every bit of his righteousness is coming forward and coming on you because you had, you had the good sense to humble yourself Humble yourself and say, yeah, I've sinned. All of us have sinned. I mean, we're all in the same boat. I had over 77 million sins and a half of one because I, I was going to sin after I got out of church. 
Instead, I got saved, honey. Come here. Let me just give you. Let's pray this together, and we're all going to help you. Say this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I really believe you're the Son of God. And the only way to heaven, I believe you died on the cross for me, taking my sins. And I believe you were raised from the dead. And right now, at Mount Hope Church, I receive you as my Savior. My Lord, fill me with a new life. When I leave this life, give me a home in heaven. Keep me from deception. And I thank you, Jesus. I have a home in heaven. I'm saved. My sins are forgiven. And I have a new life. A new start. Beginning now. Amen. Amen. Now, let me tell you this. The Bible says that, thanks, Kirk. The, the Bible says that Jesus was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. That means undo the works of the devil. Now, any of you that have got some tangled up messes that were created by sin, and you know you do, don't you? Look to Jesus because he's already beginning to untangle him. Trust him. Trust him in this. Give him time. It took you a little while to get all this, this mess. And he's slowly untying those knots. And I want to tell you, God's called some of you to be prophets and teachers and preachers and business people. You have got a great future. Amen. Give them all a big God bless you. Bless you. Bless you all. I know it took a lot of courage to get out of your seat and come up here, but you're going to be changed forever. I hope you got Pastor Kev's book. And I don't know if, am I supposed to do anything else or just let them go back to their seat or what am I supposed to do, Mr. Fill out, yeah, if, fill out the card because Pastor Kev wants to send you an email. And uh, he's not going to send you a fundraising letter when you put that down. It's, he just wants to help you in your spiritual walk. Give them a big God bless you. I want to thank you from my heart for being here. Thank you, Pastor Kev, for having me back again. Thank you for coming down here in front of all these strange people. Thank you all for praying the way you do. And thank you for loving Mary Jo and me and our family. We sure love you, and I still pray for you. Now, let's all stand. And if we could have the ministers come up, for those that would like further ministry, or if you want to spend time at the altar, if you've got some stronghold or something that you need to lay down at the foot of the cross, you can spend 5, 10, 15 minutes up at the altar if you'd like to. But right now I pray for you. I thank God for you, each one. I thank God for planning a beautiful future for you. I thank God for giving you the Holy Spirit and God's word to give you the power to discern what is true and what is false. I pray that God will give you spiritual ears that are tuned to heaven. That God will give you understanding, enlightenment, revelation. I pray that if you hurt today, God will heal those hurts. I pray that God will show you how much he loves you and the people you care about. I pray that God will bring your family that is 
into, into closer unity, into closer harmony with the Spirit of God. I pray that God give you a love for his word and studying his word. I pray for your family and people you know that you're praying for, that God will answer your prayers speedily. And above all, I pray that you, my brother, my sister, will always keep Jesus enthroned as Lord over your life, your home, and over everything you put your hand to. I pray this as a blessing for you. I speak it because I believe it. And because I believe it, I decree it for you now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless. Thank you.